Hi guys, so today is Tolkien reading day, which is a good day to celebrate the author and well it is the day to celebrate the author and so that kind of reminded me that um, I should make a video for you guys of a Hobbit reading and so this is going to be the third part and it is the third part of chapter one which is called An Unexpected Party as we know from before and it is sorry it is a longer chapter and this will finish it we have about 10 pages left and so i'm gonna try and get through it not too quickly but more quickly um i'm just gonna jump right in there's gonna, I'm gonna backtrack just a little bit into a previous paragraph from the last video just so that there's a little bit more understanding going on. So what's happened so far is all the dwarves have come in and they've eaten almost all of Bilbo's food and they've just kind of created a hubbub and they're here to discuss business and Thorin has kind of scared Bilbo by saying that they might not return from their adventure. and So we're going to pick up right there. And we're going to go to the end. And happy Tolkien reading day, guys. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff. And in its firework glare, the poor little hobbit could be seen kneeling on the hearth rug, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept on calling out, struck by lightning, struck by lightning, over and over again. And that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on the drawing room sofa with a drink at his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf, as they sat down again. Gets funny queer fits, but he is one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you have ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit, even to old Took's great-grand-uncle Bullroarer, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Green Fields and knocked their king Gulfinbull's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole. And in this way, the battle was won, and the game of golf invented at the same time. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Roar's gentler, de gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard. Gloin speaking. Pumph! <laughs> or some snort more or less like that. Will he do, do you think? And it is all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I would have been sure we'd come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped eyes on the little fellow bobbing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Then, Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The Took side had won. He suddenly felt he would, he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards, the Baggins part regretted what he did now, and he said to himself, Bobo, you were a fool, and walked right in. Put your foot in it. Pardon me, he said. If I have overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand that you are talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called being on his dignity, that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago and I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts. 
but treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild worms in the last desert, I had a great, great, great granduncle once. Bull Roarer took, and... Yes, yes, but that was a long time ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you, and I assure you there is a mark on this door, the usual one in the trade, or used to be. Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement and reasonable reward. That's how it is usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job once, at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday at tea time. Of course there is a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself, for very good reasons. You asked me to find the fourteenth man of your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let anyone say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at thirteen and have all the bad luck you like. Or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily that Gloin, at Gloin that the dwarf huddled back in his chair. And when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy eyebrows till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right, said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I've chosen Mr. B Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is. Or will be when the time comes. There is a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more than he has any idea of himself. You may possibly all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a little light on this. On the table, in the light of a big lamp with a red shade, he spread out a piece of parchment, rather like a map. This was made by Thor, your grandfather, Thorin, he said in answer to the dwarf's excited questions. It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands about it, and I know where Mirkwood is and the withered heath with the great dragon's bread. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain, said Balin. But it'll be easy to find it'll be easy enough to find him without that, if ever we arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. You see that rune on the west side, and the hand pointing to it from the other runes, that marks a hidden passage to the lower halls. If you look at the map in the beginning of the book, you will see, um, you will see the there are the runes. It may have been secret once, said Thorin, but how do we know that it is a secret any longer? Old Smog lives there long enough to find out anything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for many years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high the door, and th three may walk abreast to save the runes. But Smog could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons and only of, ho and only of hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the country round, with all his favorite walks marked out in red ink. How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside, apart from the dragon? He asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf. But in... What way this one has been hidden, we don't know without going to see. But what it says on the map, I should guess there was a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarf's method. I think that is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorin. Also, 
went on Gandalf. I forgot to mention that with the map went a key, a small and curious key. Here it is, he said and handed it to Thorin, and handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it upon a chain that hung about his neck and under his jacket. Now things begin to look more hopeful. This news alters the, them much for the better. So far we had no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the Long Lake. After that, the trouble would begin. A long time before that, I know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf. We might go from there, up along the river running, went on Thorin, taking no notice. And so, to, and so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. But we none of us liked the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it through the great cliff at the south of the mountain, and out of it comes the dragon, too, far too often, unless he has changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard. Not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands, and in this neighborhood heroes are scarce, or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for tre trees, and shields as cradles with dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off and therefore legendary. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins. The burglar. The chosen and selected burglar. So now let's get on and make some plans. Very well then, said Thorin. Supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First, I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I mean, about the gold and the dragon and all that, and how it got there and who it belongs to and so on and further. Bless me, said Thorin. Haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking about all this for hours? All the same, I should like it all plain and clear said he obstinately, putting on his business manner, usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional and live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required, remuneration, and so forth, by which he meant, what am I going to get out of it, and am I going to come back alive? No, very well, then, said Thorin. Long ago, in my grandfather Thor's time, our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Thrain the Old. But now they mined and they tunneled and they made huger halls and greater workshops and in addition I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels, too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived to the south, and were gradually spreading up the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in those days. Kings used to send for our smiths and reward even the least skillful most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices, and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find ourselves. Altogether, those were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend, and to leisure to make things beautiful just for the fun of it. Not to speak of the most marvellous and magical toys, the like of which is not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armour, armour, and jewels, and carvings, and cups, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the North. 
Undoubtedly, that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from bad, though they usually have a good notion of the current market value, and they can't make things for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of their armor. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction that dragons make from bad to worse. There was a most specially greedy, strong and wicked worm called Smaug. One day he flew up into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountains creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, I was one luckily, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and it saved my life that day. Well, from a good way off we saw the dragon settle on our mountain in a spout of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors, warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of the great gate, but there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam, and a fog fell on Dale, and in that fog the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story. It was only too common in those days. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all the halls, and lanes, and tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions, and passages. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably, for that is the dragon's way, he has piled it all up in a great heap far inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale, and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat until Dale was ruined, and all the people dead or gone. What goes on there now, I don't know for certain, but I don't suppose anyone lives nearer to the mountain than the far edge of the long lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding and cursed smog. And there we were unexpected, unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather, with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they had got away, they told me to hold my tongue, and said that one day in proper time I should know. After that we went away, and we have had to earn our livings as best we could up and down the lands, often an enough sinking as low as blacksmith work or coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure. And even now, when I will allow, we have a good bit laid by and are not so badly off. Here Thorin stroked the gold chain round his neck. We still mean to get it back and to bring our curses home to Smog if we can. I have often wondered about my father's and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door which only they knew about. But apparently they made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got a hold of it, and why it did not come down to me, the rightful heir. I did not get a hold of it. I was given it, said the wizard. Your grandfather Thrall was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin. 
cast his name. Yes, said Thorin. And Thrain, your father went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago, last Thursday. It has never been seen by you since. True. True, said Thorin. Well, your father gave me this to give to you. And if I have chosen my own time and way for handing it over, you can hardly blame me, considering the trouble I had to find you. Your father could not remember his own name when he gave me the paper. But he never told me yours. So on the whole, I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handing the map to Thorin. I don't understand, said Thorin. And Bobo felt he would have liked to say the same. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the wizard slowly and grimly, gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed, and lots of adventures of a most unpleasant sort he had. But he never got near the mountain. How he got there, I don't know. But I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the Decre Necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? Asked Thorin with a shudder, and all the dwarves shivered. Never you mind. I was finding things out as usual. And a nasty, dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost everything except the map and key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thorin. We must give a thought to the necromancer. Don't be absurd. He is an enemy far beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. If they could all be collected again from the four corners of the world... The one thing your father wished was for his son to read the map and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you. Here, here, said Bobo, and accidentally said it aloud. Hear what? They all said, turning suddenly towards him. And he was so flustered that he answered, he Hear what I've got to say. What's that? they asked. Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look round. After all, there is a side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And, well, don't you know, I think we have all talked long enough for one night, if you see what I mean. What about bed and an early start and all that? I'll give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorn. Aren't you the burglar? And isn't on the doorstep your job? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job? Not to speak of getting inside the door. But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham and starting on a journey. Fried, not poached. Mind you, don't break them. All the others had ordered their breakfast without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much. They all got up. The hobbit had to find room for them all, and filled all his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas. Before he got them all stowed and went on to his own little bed, very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did make his mind up about was not to bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The tookishness was wearing off, and he was and he was not now quite so sure that he was going to make any journey in the morning. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorne still humming to himself in the best bedroom next to him. Far over the misty mountains and cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to find our long-forgotten goal. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was long after the break of day when he woke up. And that is the entirety of chapter one. 
And chapter two, I will start eventually, is called Roast Mutton. I think you can see. And really quickly, we have the map in the beginning that we have to look at, because I kind of briefly sort of mentioned it. Where is it? All right. So this is the map that we're talking about. And these are the runes and the arrow. They're pointing to this side of the mountain. So that's the map. It's a cool map. So yeah. Happy token reading day, guys.